Contrary to what most people use them as, cameras are tools. Tools that capture light patterns and translate them to images, whether via electronic sensor or emulsion on substrate. Being tools, good ones used for professional work are usually quite large, antiquated DSLRs and more modern mirrorless cameras with large sensors are usually burdensome to carry around. Most people don't mind due to the excellent image quality afforded, but you know, when you're just out wandering around somewhere new or want to get decent snaps of your beloved cat, these things can be a big pain in the ass. Seriously, when you're out walking around, even with a modestly sized mirrorless camera like this XE1 and you stop and eat or need to carry something else, it can get kind of annoying. Sometimes you want to go out and not carry around a big brick. Enter the smartphone. No, wait, I don't want to be stuck with a 24 millimeter equivalent field of view and huge penalties if I want some telephoto action, since sensors behind telephoto lenses are smaller on smartphones with multiple lenses. And digital zoom, that's useless. I want the feature set of a DSLR and something that easily fits into my skinny jeans pocket. Well, at least something kind of close. Today, we'll be looking at a camera that at least attempts to do that, the Canon PowerShot S100. Does it give you at least pretty decent photographic power and a pocketable form factor? Will it be worth bringing with you over just your phone? Let's find out. Canon has made high-end prosumer compact digital cameras since the early days with the Canon G-Series. Uh, despite being more compact than a DSLR or bridge camera, they are still pretty bulky. The PowerShot S-Series fixes that by taking G-Series guts and features and stuffing them into a tiny compact body. The S-Series started out way, way back in 1999, but we're talking about the more modern incarnations, what we'll call the third generation, which started 10 years later in 2009. Our S100 is the third iteration in the third generation, coming out in late 2011. You get a large for, by you know, compact camera standards, 12.1 megapixel, 1 to 1.7 inch, I don't really know how to say that, CMOS sensor, 1080p 24 is the highest it goes for video, and you get GPS for whatever that's worth. It shoots raw and JPEG and is capable of loading custom firmware to milk more features from it. This particular overview will not include that, but if this video proves popular, I'll look at the camera again with CHDK, or the Canon Hackers Development Kit. Uh, the lens is a 24 to 140 millimeter equivalent zoomer, all motorized with manual focus by wire. At the wide end, you get a bright f2, but it dips all the way down to f5.9 on the long end. For depth of field, that equates to f9.2 to f27.1 due to the tiny sensor. Keep in mind that while this equivalency affects depth of field, light gathered is still considered the same as it would with you know, a full frame sensor, meaning that at f2, the sensor is still getting a ton of light. Before we go any further, we'll look at the cost. Mine was $10 in the original box with accessories. Why? I'll tell you exactly why. You see, there are two different Canon S100s. This one is from 2011. It is modern and still what I would consider useful. The other Canon S100 is a two megapixel camera from the year 2000. I think the seller on eBay checked other listings and thought the prices were for the same camera. That old S100 is pretty cool for different reasons. It has a very unique sensor, but it isn't worth the 100 to 150 dollar average asking price for a used working modern S100. So if you want a modern S100, look through the listings of old ones, find a seller that doesn't know what they're doing, grab it, and don't say a word. Maybe leave a snarky positive feedback. While we're on the topic of acquisition, S100s are problem prone and Canon no longer services them. The main issue is a lens error that happens when the ribbon cable on the inside either breaks or comes disconnected. If you're handy, you might be able to fix that one. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard, but I'm not going to recommend it. This mainly affects only a certain range of serial numbers, but compact cameras have a lot of points of failure, so buy with caution. They also tend to get beat around quite a bit, so look at detailed pictures to make sure your new-ish S100 wasn't in a pocket with a bunch of car keys most of its life. As for the body, it is Canon and it is high-end. All metal, including the tripod mount, not including the battery door or rubberized port cover. 
for ports, you get mini HDMI, which is actually really cool to have for what this is, and an AV slash USB jack. Mine came with a battery blank that allows you to plug in an AC adapter, but the battery is a Canon NB-5L. Aftermarket batteries are cheap, and I'd pick up at least two. The Canon charger works with aftermarket batteries just fine, although I will say the Castar batteries that I bought drain very quickly and don't report battery life accurately. I don't know if these are just terrible batteries or the camera has terrible battery life, especially with video, so more testing is needed there. The S100 either comes in black or silver, and I think the black is more common. The black has a nice feeling coating that isn't rubberized, and it's not slippery. I think it's anodized. Uh, the little front ridge does more than it would appear to, at least with my small fingers, and there's a little thumb grip on the upper right corner of the back that feels pretty good. The buttons feel exactly as they should on a premium name brand camera like this. Fantastic and clicky without being loud or feeling hollow. The red record button is slightly recessed too. On top you get a rotary dial which selects modes with your standard program, time value, aperture value, and manual modes, along with a custom mode that you probably won't use. There are also the green auto mode for people who bought this thinking that spending more money would equate to better looking photos along with HDR, something called Movie Digest, and the video recording mode. There's also the zoom rocker, which is as you'd expect, and the shutter button, also as you'd expect. The on and off switch is in a weird spot, being a button right next to the shutter button. Thankfully, it is recessed and it feels totally different from the shutter button, but still, they really need to put it there. Next is the motorized pop-up flash, another potential point of failure, way to go. I really like the ring function button on the back, partially because it is your custom mappable button, so you can just set it to ISO selection, and part because I'm playing ring fit, and it reminds me of that. It is actually referring to the rotating ring that is also a D-pad, which works much in the same way as the dials on a DSLR, allowing you to change your shutter speed manual mode. Looking at the front really quick. Uh, probably the star feature of the S100, the big ring around the lens, which is mapped to change the aperture by default. Speaking of defaults, the functionality of these rings and some buttons can be adjusted in the menus. While more comprehensive than your average compact, the menus are pretty easy to navigate and you'll have an easy time figuring out what you want to mess with if you're used to using digital cameras in general. If not, RTFM, read the manual, which I recommend doing anyway. It can easily be found online. The display is really nice. It's a 3 inch, 461,000 pixel non touch display. This isn't crazy by today's standards, but it looks great considering the time period. I have mine set up to display the histogram in real time and to zoom in on the spot the camera is focusing on. So far, I'm finding the second feature to be pretty useless, as the display isn't giving me any kind of focus peaking and the resolution of the live view isn't high enough for me to really confirm focus beyond seeing if it is grossly out of focus or not. Image quality, well, where are your expectations? Early CMOS, small sensor, 12.1 megapixel, tiny lens. Considering all that, I'd say it's pretty good. Comparing JPEG and RAW, the camera seems to apply lens correction and change the colors a bit, uh, usually for the worse. Let's actually start there with the lens. If you aren't used to shooting RAW with a compact camera, you might be surprised at how much distortion there is. This is a pretty big sensor for a camera of this size, so it is going to catch a lot of that gross distortion on the edges and severe vignetting. There also needs to be a lot of re-warping of the image via lens correction at wider focal lengths. This isn't a quality issue, the engineers just have to go really far to make a lens that covers that focal length with an image circle big enough to cover the sensor in a camera this size. For what it is, I'd say they did a pretty good job. At the long end, there is very little distortion at all, which considering the lens's physical size, it, it kind of makes sense. This is also helped by the tiny f5.9 aperture at the long end. There is another oddity of compact camera raw photography to look at, diffraction and sharpness when stopping down. You do not want to stop down much when you're using such a tiny system. What would usually be sharp at f5.6 is actually softer on the short end than say f2.8. And F8? F8 is when things turn to absolute garbage. So Canon employed a killer feature that I should have mentioned earlier, an inbuilt real-life ND filter. This thing cuts three stops of light when enabled, 
allowing you to keep a bigger aperture when it is super bright or do that cool water mist thing. It isn't done in software either. It actually drops the ND element into the light path. If you look into the lens when you enable it, you can actually see and hear it. I can't catch it on camera. Another potential point of failure, but I'll take this one. This isn't the first camera to have an inbuilt ND filter either. The Canon PowerShot Pro 1 had this back in 2004, and I think the Pro 70 of 1998 had one too. Now, I'm not gonna hire models or do any thing particularly crazy for the sample images, so I'll mostly just be using my local free models. They aren't particularly tidy with their appearance and usually have four legs, but they will work for food and show off sensor detail really well. And a good light, the detail is definitely there. Since these cameras have, as a byproduct of their design, a really deep depth of field, you're capturing tons of detail uh, by pure virtue of the lens design and the sensor is sharp enough to pick it up. In this example, Gary's eyes look sharp and his fur has tons of detail. The pinks and yellows of the flowers here look good. And check out the greens of these demi cactus things. And these are the JPEGs. Usually I wouldn't give much attention to the JPEGs, but I think with this camera, that's what most people are gonna be shooting, reserving the time spent working on the raw files for the best of the bunch. Base ISO on this thing is 80, and I mostly tested it between 80, 400, and 800. I also accidentally got a couple shots at 1600. Rather than having you sit through me screwing around with the raw files in a development program, I'll just show you my results compared to the out-of-camera JPEGs. This will give you a good idea of what you can do with the files. This photo of Gregory, a feline, was shot at ISO 400. Being that there is an extremely light background and a very dark foreground, I had to sort of find a middle ground that I knew the camera wasn't going to know what to do with, as evidenced by the bare minimal differences between the RAW file and the out-of-camera JPEG. This might cause someone to think that the photo is a lost cause, but plenty of detail can still be extracted and color noise in his darker fur can be mitigated while still brightening it up and giving it some contrast even without popping a flash. Uh, there's still enough color information in the eyes to work with as well, and the background can be toned down, although some information is still lost. Again, at ISO 400, again Gregory, and it looks like whatever happened in the background is totally blown out. There gets to be a point where highlights are unrecoverable, but you may be surprised at how much color information is actually still there. Not only was I able to recover Gregory and make him look nice, but much of the backdrop was able to be recovered as well. Here's Gregory again, this time at ISO 800. I would say that this is about the extent of what would be considered usable. Now, a huge amount of the backdrop is blown out, but the shadows are very usable, allowing me to recover a lot of information. Here's one at ISO 80, where the camera had trouble with the color situation. These flowers are much pinker than the JPEG shows, but since we have the raw file and the color data is there, I was able to bring more color accuracy and bring back quite a bit of detail while darkening the back to enhance the overall composition. The camera does an okay job without a white balance, but I am finding that colors could still use significant correction in post. This modern apartment building is another example. As you can see, colors tend to skew toward the green in general. Uh, this can be fixed in camera, and I would recommend doing so before planned shooting. But if you're just out walking around, not knowing what you're going to see, you will likely forget this step and end up doing it in post. While not the greatest composition ever, very basic, quick, raw development yielded a vastly superior photo, in my opinion. I actually chose this photo because I wanted to show the lens distortion at the 24mm equivalent. It is severe and uneven. There was significant quality control issues with this camera. Many of them left the factory with misaligned lenses. Some were so bad, images were overall usually very soft and it called for an RMA. This one appears to be a misaligned as the left hand side is much softer than the right, meaning the lens isn't properly lined up with the sensor, but much of this is due to aforementioned design limitations and the lens correction is able to correct for a lot of this. Here I performed a two second long exposure at ISO 80. I wanted to wait until it got a little darker, but the battery died, so this is what I had to work with. I wanted to blur the water and it looks like a mess. This works better with much longer exposures. Overall, the image just looks muddy and flat. 
but with some post-processing it looks a lot better. The sky has, was retained and it looks pretty good. Water still looks like trash and color differences in the water look splotchy so this would need a lot more work to look really decent. The camera does have macro focusing at all focal lengths. At the long end there isn't much distortion but you can't get very close. Still, this is preferable to macro at the 24 millimeter equivalent, which is just gonna give you a lot of distortion despite making focusing much closer. Couple of other things. Autofocus is fast and accurate. Manual focus is focused by wire and it works just fine. Overall, I give the camera a high score. It does its job well. Image quality is generally surprisingly good and raw files despite being from such a small, early CMOS sensor are very usable and give pretty tremendous flexibility and decent dynamic range. The lens is very decent, especially given the engineering challenge that it is designing a lens this small for a sensor this you know, large in relation to what it is. Um, all the core functions are there without a whole lot of useless feature bloat. It really isn't a pain in the ass to carry around with you. You don't look weird in a crowd and you won't really catch people staring at you unless you are unusually attractive. You may be unusually attractive, but the camera looks boring and that is fine. It looks like a tool in a good way. Longevity is going to be one of its weak points as it has a lot of mechanical points of failure and has a history of unreliability. Um, this may be tied to the aforementioned QC issues. At between $80 and $150, it is more expensive on the gray market than many other options, including some older DSLRs, but is a good option if you are in the market for something like this. So overall, 8 out of 10. Thank you for watching. Comment below if you have one of these or one of its relatives, or if you have any questions about it, or just anything. Uh, leave me a like if this video is helpful or at least interesting or entertaining, and please, have a good one.